we have to offer homeless people two choices, jail or rehab. Seattle's experiencing a human crisis right now. Portland was known for a mecca of the homeless to come in for the resources, but then the resources ran out, and so you come here and now what? So the homelessness in San Francisco is out of control. At, at what point do the locals here say, we've had enough? If you all look around with me, we call this the skyline of oppression. I feel like they've been talking and saying the same thing for so long. I don't want to see you on camera anymore. I don't want you to write any more articles on how much you care and how much you're trying to change things. I want to see you doing it. Portland needs to fix this. It's not just Portland's problem, it's actually the whole state's problem. You just can't be only nice, but there has to be consequences. So the conversation has moved from displacement to banishment. Well, let's just put it this way. Which Republican in City Hall can you blame this on? Yeah, I always wanted to come back. And, you know, now that my kids are grown and they don't need me like they did, you know what I mean, yeah. before. Uh, Do your kids know that you don't have a home here? Uh... I don't know. Um, but, you know, uh, I don't plan on being homeless forever. So the homelessness in San Francisco is out of control. I would say the majority of people that are homeless are not homeless. They're mentally ill slash drug addicts. This is a question you need to be asking. Why do the police let it go on right in front of them? Is it because of that bill that they passed? It made everything a misdemeanor, even heroin, simple possession of meth and heroin are misdemeanors now. So it's not worth the cops' time. The Supreme Court gave a ruling that the overcrowding in the California prisons was cruel and unusual punishment, and they threatened to cut off the Fed dollar if they didn't do something about it. So that's why they're not arresting everybody anymore. They can't put them all in prison because they got a Supreme Court ruling against them that called it cruel and unusual in punishment, how crowded the prisons were. The whole goal of Prop 47 had multiple aspects to it. The goal was to be more helpful to society, helpful to the homeless issue, helpful to the police departments and the court system. But as we saw, that's a total failure at, at this point. The connection between those who are homeless and drug abusers, it has a direct correlation in a sense. These who are homeless and uh, in possession of drugs are not going to be prosecuted and taken out of the homeless realm and thrown into jail as long as what they possess is less than $950. The intention was to help, of course, but what it really wound up doing is it made San Francisco more attractive for those who are both homeless and those who are drug addicts to move here. We're now finding that homelessness is increasing, drug addiction is increasing, and the number of people here the numbers are increasing as well. Hey, I'm killing you, okay? F you. She, she, she homeless every day. The window. Yes, every day. And you have to clean it up. Yes. What's happened is that over the years, before homelessness was the crisis that we're having now, is that San Francisco was always looked at as being a, a fun, musical, free, welcoming of, of people from all over the world. But now, as we see that the city has very much changed, at what point do the locals here just say, we've had enough? Other cities stick them on buses and send them here. And now this is like a homeless camp. 
what happens is they're building too many condominiums and kicking the people out. High cost of living, which also pushes out affordable housing initiatives, which also pushes out homeless shelters because those are like the first thing to go. Quality of life laws have to be enforced. Urinating on the street, defecating, sleeping, shooting heroin on the street should be illegal. While some locals are clearly frustrated with the homeless crisis, others seem to be either desensitized or completely heartbroken. I mean, I see it every day. Uh, where I work in Berkeley, there's a semi-permanent camp right on the block where they'll get cleared out every few weeks and they come back. It's something that's around that I see every day. I mean, it's hard to get the logic on it if some of the economic indicators say in general, we're doing better, and yet just to walk down the street, clearly that's not the case for a lot of folks. Just right now, where we are uh, walking from City Hall, if I walk one block that way, I move from seeing professionals to seeing 10 people in a row actively cooking meth and shooting up, sleeping either in tents or just crashed out on the, on the sidewalk in the juxtaposition of Union Square and like elite economic shops on one end, government wealth on the other end. It just doesn't seem fathomable the way that the reality is. How do I engage with fellow members of, of my city without feeling like I'm looking at them to see what they are? It does appear to be growing. It's a complex system issue. One perspective is just the economic structure of capitalism right now is increasing the division between the wealthy and the poor. And we're seeing it here in San Francisco, one of the wealthiest cities in America. So there's a few different schools of thought, but one of them specifically goes back to the early 1960s. That was when the last Republican mayor's administration finished up and voted in a democratic mayor which has been the situation all the way till today and so before this in 1964 or so we've had a whole string of republican conservative mayorships then after that when the democrats were voted in we had the poverty homeless everything as you see and that has never changed unless there is a fundamental change in getting more conservative, more centrist candidates elected to office, elected to the mayorship, elected to the city council or board of supervisors. There's not going to be a change. And the latest change the local government has come up with is an interesting one, to say the least. San Francisco reached over 8,000 people, and they say about 35% of unsheltered homeless citizens live in vehicles. While the number can't be precise, there's a good chance it's far beyond 30. guaranteed income. You know, sometimes I wonder how much both private and government money is spent on paying people to come up with solutions and provide services and intakes and referrals. If somebody actually had a meaningful amount of money that wasn't the kind of money that lets me imagine getting through the next few days. What if somebody had $10,000 and could imagine making a deposit and could imagine setting up with some long-term health care or mental health? Clearly, the mediating of services can't be the only thing. They're allowing the, the rich to get richer and never stop them. It's just if they don't stop the rent control, that they, they let the landlords increase their rent as much as they can, they'll continue to do that. 
And one day I'm gonna be in the streets too. <laughs> I don't think there is one answer because I don't think it's one problem. A portion of the homeless community which are people that are working in and around the area that just can't afford to live someplace. The answer to that isn't the same answer as the people who have been failed by our mental health system. There's a lot of work to be done in a lot of places. Policies that the government is enforcing and, and promoting is the problem with homelessness. The more you give homeless people to try and help them, the byproduct of that is more homeless people and more people trying to take advantage of this and probably more businesses that are nonprofit trying to help popping up. And their whole intention is to keep more people in this cycle because they're getting money for it. At some point, this people have to realize you just can't be only nice and only try and help, which you should, but there has to be consequences. People get ready, there's a train a coming, breaking up passengers from coast to coast. I love to sing, and I think in my songs I have a message. What's your message? The message is love one another. Just love one another. Yes, there's a lot more people struggling. You're seeing a lot more homeless than you used to see. So what do you th what do you attribute that to since you've been here? In one word, greed. We see a lot of folks living uh, in tents and other structures along the freeway, under the freeway, in really unsafe conditions. We're a very tech center city now with Amazon growing and of course Microsoft being here and other tech businesses. Real estate has gone up, rentals has gone up, people can't hardly afford. What do they do when they can't afford to pay their rent? Many of them end up on the streets, sadly. This isn't a new phenomenon in Seattle, it's just a problem that has gone unaddressed for so long. Excuse me, I want to say something to this place. I want to say that Seattle is a beautiful city. It's a lot of problem with the homeless, but guess what? We will survive because the law will protect all those. Amen. Seattle is experiencing a human crisis right now. Seattle is experiencing a crisis of what happens when people who have have more and more and more, and it makes people who don't have a lot have less and less and none. What actually is happening, people are struggling, people have been suffering for a really long time, and it's pouring out to where now you can't ignore it anymore. And now it's the city's problem, but it has been these people's problems and these people's lives and reality for a very long time. And so. Surprise. There are no places for the mentally ill to go anymore, so where do they go? They're on the streets. I see it every day walking up and down here while I'm working. I work, you know, in the building across the street and, you know, there's shootings. I see people as I walk between buildings dealing drugs during the middle of the day. Police standing right next to him, not doing anything. I literally saw a woman smoking crack in her wheelchair right by my bus stop. I've also seen this same woman selling drugs. That's her life, and it makes me really sad. We see too much crime. We see too many folks using and, and dealing drugs on the sidewalk. We see folks with untreated mental illness not connected to services. So it's all of that, and we need to break apart all those issues because the strategies and interventions are different, and we, and we need to be smart about how we're applying those strategies so we can really be effective. Uh, the 
the decriminalization of drugs in and of itself is a problem. I'm not a proponent of prisons or any of that stuff. That's not what I'm suggesting. But when you decriminalize something so you don't have to deal with it, you know, you're really still solving the problem. We've had our political arguments in Seattle of, of how to go about solving it. We had a proposal last year to tax all jobs in Seattle that, that we thought was not the right approach, uh, and neither did the public, and so it was repealed. The problem is everybody has a different idea about how to attack homelessness. Having city council, county council, and the mayor's office get on the same page about what a proper approach is has been almost impossible in any city. People have different ideas. People want to throw money at it, but where to throw money? Do we throw money into resources? Do we throw money into buildings? It takes a while to build buildings. How much money actually is it going to take to house everyone that's homeless right now? What do we do in the meantime? Do we need to build more shelters? It's so many questions. Like, you could bite this apple 15 directions, but the energy it takes to bite it in 15 spaces is the energy that's lost actually biting at 15 bites directly to the center and getting to the core. We believe that our faith in Jesus Christ is actually the core of where healing begins. We provide an environment where people can stabilize and we actually have steps that they can move forward and get jobs and careers and houses and all those sort of things. But really at the end of the day, it's about God showing up in their life and then surrounding them with community. We plug them into local churches that are the long-term support for them. All of our ambassador positions in our cleaning program have really been oriented around folks coming out of homelessness that are living on the street one day and then a week later they might be cleaning that same portion of the street, but now they're getting wages and, and benefits, they got a retirement plan. We make an intentional effort to go to organizations and, and places where we can directly connect with folks who are homeless. Sometimes they find us because they see an ambassador in uniform working out on the street and they say, how do I get one of those jobs? And so you'll talk to a lot of folks on our team and that's how they got connected to us. And they've been cleaning a sidewalk for 10 years that they used to sleep on. Seattle seems to have more than enough services for the homeless community, which makes them rather close to solving the issue. What they need to do is find a way to gather their services to create one goal to help the city. They all do seem to agree on one thing, though. Well, hopefully in five years, the money that has been given to help create places for the homeless to go, that those people will be at home and that people don't feel unsafe to walk in the streets because I've been here all my life and it's, it's very hard to see. We have some approaches that we know work. Housing first and we've been leaders nationally with some of the nonprofits here that have developed that model and we're expanding that effort with a lot of investment from the private sector in some of those campaigns that nonprofits are leading. The building for affordable housing has not kept up at all with the building for high-priced housing. At the rate that people are being displaced because they can't afford to live in places like Seattle, there haven't been alternatives built at the same rate. And so I think that has a lot to do with the homelessness issue in Seattle. So I just think there's it's a very complex situation that it's gonna require complex answers. And people have a very complex situation and they want simple, fast answers. And that's just not the humane way to respond. I'm ashamed of what this president is doing. I'm not shocked by it. We have a homelessness crisis here, taking all these people and putting them on the street. And this president, his last two budget requests, has tried to completely eliminate the CDBG program, cutting out all housing funds. He's been cruel and unusual to immigrants who are part of the engine that grows this country. So I'm fed up. Most of those in places who should respond to the crisis are just saying, don't worry, I'm going to have another survey. I'm gonna do another research project. And by the time that thing is over, I'll be out of office. There is not a single individual that I talk to in a local government who does not see this as the moral and political crisis of the time. There's 
been this myth that houselessness in Los Angeles is off the Richter scale because people come to Los Angeles because of the weather. And so it's this idea that houselessness here is not a homegrown problem. If it's not a homegrown problem, you really can't blame it on structural inequality that policymakers should be paying attention to. 80% of those who are houseless in Los Angeles come from Los Angeles. Los Angeles manufactures its own houseless crisis. Many folks houseless in Los Angeles now are houseless in the communities that they used to be housed in. So my name is Peter Lin. I am the executive director for the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority. We are a governmental agency. I have been leading LASA for the last four and a half years. I think the challenge that we face on the local government side is that some of these factors are major systemic issues. So for example, the aftermath of mass incarceration well, we as a municipality are dealing with a lot of people who've been de-incarcerated, but the legacy of that trauma and those stigmas and the records they have lives on for people. So, you know, there's enough of a challenge that exists at all different levels, but there is not a single elected official in Los Angeles I've ever spoken to who doesn't see this as urgent and a massive humanitarian and moral crisis. <laughs> first moved and lived on Skid Row when I was 15. My family moved and we moved to the Union Rescue Mission. And it's difficult, especially when you're a kid, to be living in shelters and going and living on Skid Row and going through these sort of things and still have to like go to school and be like, hi everybody, you know, so. I know a number of people that actually have full-time minimum wage jobs and still have to live in their tent because the cost of affordable living is so ridiculously high. The average amount that a person makes a year is about the same amount as a one-bedroom apartment. You're making exactly what you need to pay your rent, but that's not all you need to survive. Money is being dished out in other areas instead of housing specifically. You put more beds in shelters, you're still homeless. If you're in a shelter that's temporary living, you're putting money there, whereas you could be putting money for permanent housing. It's the way the money can be spent. LA has about the least affordable housing market in America, and the pressure is felt most acutely on the poorest Angelina. So people are being driven into homelessness by the housing market moving much more rapidly than the poorest Angelina's income. So that's really what we're seeing. Last year, we housed 21,000 people, and more people became homeless every day than we were housing. That's a massive systemic challenge for us. We need to get upstream and, and make housing affordability a priority. That way we can get ahead of this. Oh yeah, so if you all look around with me, we call this the skyline of oppression. There are cranes everywhere. There's a building boom going on in downtown Los Angeles. There's a 12 to 14% vacancy rate in downtown Los Angeles. That's scandalous. How do you have informal settlements and encampments cropping up everywhere, and at the same time, as quickly as a skyscraper goes up, 10 more encampments spread out? It's a vision of LA that leaves out those who have built Los Angeles. Politicians also seem to be afraid. They don't have the language, they don't have the visceral understanding of what the community is like, and aren't thinking in ways that are creative and aren't thinking in ways that are relevant. When I started the work, there was a conversation of displacement, because displacement suggests if you can't afford to live here, you could potentially afford to live somewhere else in the region. 
with gentrification happening at a feverish pitch from Skid Row to Manhattan, we're not talking about a conversation around displacement because all subsidies around us and all places in the county are doing the same things. So the conversation has moved from displacement to banishment. I feel like they've been talking and saying the same thing for so long. I don't want to see you on camera anymore. I don't want you to write any more articles on how much you care and how much you're trying to change things. I want to see you doing it. I think it's completely understandable for people to be frustrated. Angelinos need to take responsibility for accepting the kinds of changes to our community that are necessary, which means that we have to build more and we need to accept more density. And that I think is something that there's a conversation at all levels of community in the neighborhood planning and neighborhood councils at the city council district level, but in city hall, we need to build more. And if we don't build more, we're not gonna get ahead of this crisis. In the meantime, as we prepare to build more, we need much more serious and robust renter protections. There are no protections uh, statewide against rent gouging. You talk to people, you hear stories about, you know, somebody's rent moving in, you know, a few different jumps. So they get a 35% rent increase in less than a year. Those are the kinds of rents that drive people into homelessness. Those are rent increases that, that absolutely wash out people. You know, and those are the kinds of things that, you know, we can enact immediately. So I think there are fun fundamental activities that need to take place at all levels of government. People are absolutely right to be frustrated, but part of that frustration needs to be channeled at positive communications in their city council meetings to say, we need to build more housing, we need to build it now. My friend, close to 90% of us are mentally ill. And that's why you got garbage everywhere. They're not normal, man. We live with them out here, them poor bastards. Is there any help for them, do you think, out here? Sure, they're called people that don't want to do their god jobs. That's why they're out here. Portland was known for a mecca of the homeless to come in for the resources, but then the resources ran out, and so you come here and now what? A lot of these people are mentally ill and they're not getting the kind of help that they need. I think the problem is it's very hard to access help from the street. How do we then address that issue? If you have larger numbers of people that are living on the street, how are services getting to them as opposed to how are they getting to services? We've had people come in from out of town saying, what's the problem in Portland? What's going on here? People do not feel safe or feel comfortable coming downtown because of it. I've literally had people running into my store saying, I do not feel safe. That's one thing that actually flipped my switch and I'm like, Portland needs to fix this. It's not just Portland's problem, it's actually the whole state's problem. They put blinders on a lot. Sadly, it's become the norm. And when you see stuff enough and all of that, it's just like, oh, there's a garbage can with all the stuff pulling out. I'm at the bus stop. I set my backpack down to get a bus pass. I look behind the bench and there's an uncapped needle. I can see both sides of it. So as a business owner, I work really hard and I see people sleeping on the side of the street and it's extremely frustrating to see that and I want something to be done right away. And I see the other side of it of, you know, what is the most effective way to handle this issue? Uh, these are people and they should be treated as such. We're trying to break out the norm of saying homelessness is a negative stereotype where it's like every single homeless person is drug addicted or mental health or something like that. That's not right because that's just picking on one group of people. What are the issues? What's that? And it's the mental health drug issues. So I'm 
Julia Orlando. I'm the director of the Bergen County Housing Health and Human Services Center. So Bergen County is the first community in the country, in our nation, to have achieved the end of chronic homelessness. There are people who are living on the street who have mental illness who don't know they have mental illness. That issue is very profound. And yes, medication helps that, absolutely. And people's, they vary. Sometimes they're more reachable and then other times they're not reachable. But we should be doing that from housing. We had a, a woman come serious mentally ill when she came to us. She'd been living on the streets. She had been in a domestic violence situation. She wasn't making any sense. After a couple days of sleep, and food, her symptoms were much better. And I realized that her being outside was really exacerbating. Yes, there was mental health issues, but they were not as profound as we were seeing them. So what we know is that once we're providing basic needs, once people can go to sleep and they're not afraid someone's gonna put their hands on them or they're gonna steal their things, we see people can stabilize. A lot of people are saying we need to get houses for the homeless. There are some people that just do not want help. And it's sadly the drug abuse and also the mental health. They're actually the ones that are causing this issue. I think the city, the state, and also the county need to work as a cohesive group to actually help these two problems. I think the solution does need to come from a systemic change of how we're dealing with this. It can't lay on the shoulders of any one group, police, business owners, citizens, anybody. It can't just be on any one person's shoulders or the government. It's very important that care is coordinated with law enforcement, with treatment, and with the outreach folks who work with the homeless. When you have systems that are doing this wonderful job in themselves, but they're not coordinated, you really struggle to make a significant difference. Skip one latte, skip one after work beer for the day for someone else. Even when it comes to like politicians and bigwigs that want to line, you don't have to donate all of your luxury cars, all of your fancy homes, but just think about giving up one of them. Just trim the fat, you know? You still get yours, but you're helping someone else out too. So maybe someone to guide them or more government resources, officers that come out and actually help the problem as opposed to arresting people and throwing their tents away. Finland has done this successfully. You can Google it. They have a clinic where you can go in the morning at 7 a.m. and get drugs. Then you go to your job, hi. Then you have housing provided for you. And what they have shown is that these people stop doing drugs over time. There's one or two folks that continue to use drugs. That when you have a purpose and a community and a place to sleep, the problem goes away. At the end of the day, it's housing that ends homelessness. So how are we gonna get people to housing? But what happens is when funding gets cut, then a lot of these really innovative ideas aren't able to be sustained. In other words, if we're going to send people to housing, we have to have communities that are welcoming that. Mm -hmm.